I can start sharing. Um, my spotlight here. Share my screen. You're still spotlighted. And I'm okay. Just everybody. And can everyone see my screen? Yes. Perfect. <clears throat> so we'll mainly be talking about glass and glass blowing in the 19th and 20th centuries in New Bedford. Um, but I did want to touch upon the history of glass making and glass blowing. So really people have been making glass for about 4,000 years. It's not clear whether the first man-made glass was made in ancient Egypt or Mesopotamia, which is now present day Iraq and Northern Syria, but we do know that it emerged around 2300 BC. And we know more about early glass making in ancient Egypt over Mesopotamia um, for a few reasons, partly because of the ancient Egyptian custom of burying the dead with objects needed in the afterlife, and partly because of that country's dry climate, which is conducive to the preservation of glass. And so I'll also just briefly touch upon um, glass blowing in ancient Rome. Um, Roman glassware includes some of the finest pieces of art ever produced in antiquity. Um, the Roman Empire used more glass than any other ancient civilization. And really it was present in nearly every aspect of their daily Roman life. And that was because glass blowing was discovered in the first century. Um, and this was because to allow it to become present in nearly every aspect of daily Roman life, glass blowing allowed glass workers to produce vessels with considerably thinner walls, which decreased the amount of glass needed for each vessel. And it was also um, a lot quicker than other glass making techniques. And so as a result, this was more than just a luxury, it was a material uh, commonly available. And so some objects you may find in the Roman period were plain glass vessels, such as cups, bowls, plates, and bottles. Um, glass was also used by the Romans for its decorative qualities and could be incorporated into mosaics and decorative panels in both walls and furniture. Glass was also used for windows to create jewelry, mirrors, and even magnifying glasses. But really what we're gonna focus on is glass in New Bedford. So if we just move forward about 2000 years, we enter glass industry in New Bedford in 1869 and 1867 with New Bedford Glass Works. And the directors and owners were all New Bedford businessmen, but due to financial difficulties, the plant closed just a few years later in 1869. And two of the main names that you hear about when thinking of New Bedford Glass history is Mount Washington Glass Works and Pearpoint. And uh, the name Mount Washington comes from a hill in South Boston where the first glass factory was located in 1837. In 1869, the company moved to New Bedford where they bought the defunct factory of New Bedford Glassworks. And Mount Washington Glass Company always manufactured glass in the latest styles, including many types of art glass. And art glass were called for pieces that were meant to decorate the parlor and dining room of Victorian homes. Mount Washington operated from 1870 until 1894 and produced some of the most diverse and beautiful assortment of American art glass of the Victorian era. And so another name you hear a lot, of course, is Pearpoint. And so in 1880, Mount Washington hired Thomas Pearpoint, an English silversmith, to run a silver company adjacent to the glass company. The company manufactured all types of household goods, including silverware, tableware, jewelry, and cigarette cases, just to name a few. And although Pearpoint was initially run as a separate company, in 1894, the two companies merged to become the Pearpoint Corporation. And so although New Bedford's principal glass factory changed names and management several times over a 90 year span, the skill of its workers represented by the quality of their products really remained constant. And all these names became synonymous with fine quality hand-blown glass and handmade glass. And at Pearpoint in the 1880s, nearly all the workers were skilled craftsmen. It was estimated that 200 young men from New Bedford schools were trained and worked for the company. And by 1897, when the two companies had merged to become the Pearpoint, Pear, sorry, Pearpoint Corporation, um, New Bedford was celebrating its semi-centennial and Pearpoint at the time had 1200 employees. And really going into the first quarter of the 20th century, this was a great uh, period of great prosperity for Pearpoint. They introduced a variety of both glass and silver products and established themselves as leaders of the industry. 
And here I just have a list of the different major glass manufacturers in New Bedford over that 90 year span. It can get a bit confusing. Um, we started with New Bedford Glassworks, which really in a blink of an eye, they were gone, but mainly we have Mount Washington and Pearpoint, which ended in Gunderson Pearpoint in 1956. So here I just have a clip that I wanted to show you um, from 1965 when the old Pearpoint factory burned down while I sort of explain about the end of glass blowing in New Bedford. So there were several factors that led to the end of glass blowing in New Bedford. There was the Great Depression along with competition from abroad, mainly from the United Kingdom and Japan. This along with high wages in the glass making industry in the US made it difficult to keep up. Pearpoint was reorganized as Gunderson Glassworks in 1939. Robert Gunderson was a master glassblower, um, but after his death in 1952, the company once again changed their name, this time to Gunderson Pearpoint. <clears throat> and then, um, of course, in 1957, they changed it to the Pearpoint Glass Company. Now, in New Bedford, the company ceased operations in December 1956 and briefly relocated to East Wareham, then overseas to Spain, and then back to the US where they opened in a newly built factory in Sagamore, Massachusetts, along the Cape Cod Canal in 1970, which is still around today. Um, but on October 2nd, 1965, a fire ripped through the old Pearpoint factory, completely destroying it. My dad was actually nine years old at the time and remember standing on the corner and watching it burn down that day. And the Pearpoint fire was one of the toughest mill fires that New Bedford firefighters battled in the city's history. It required the aid of firefighters from surrounding towns. The flames were so intense that it blew horizontally out of the brick factory windows like a blowtorch, which you can kind of see from this video here. And what I also find fascinating from this news footage is that you can see how close people's homes were to the factory. I think if I skip ahead, I might be able to show yeah, you can see how close the houses were in New Bedford to this uh, factory. Um, and this video itself is interesting to watch. It is six minutes long, but I will have to skip forward to the next slide. So when I was thinking of changing out the case in the RJD, that's kind of one of the most exciting parts of my job as the manager of collections at the RJD is that I get to work on exhibits and work on um, changing out these glass cases to something that maybe I find interesting. And for me, glass is really interesting and personal to me because my father is a glass blower. Um, he's retired now, but I do have a lot of fond memories growing up in the 90s and hanging out with my father at Cape Cod Glassworks where he worked and later at his own shop in New Bedford before he retired. And so, in the case itself, which I hope everyone has a chance to see in person, on the I decided to showcase 19th versus more contemporary 20th century glass. So on the left, we have some of our older pieces, including pieces that my father loaned for the case, but also pieces at the RJD. And on the right, we have pieces of glass that my father made. And so I thought I would just touch upon some of the highlights that we have in the case. Um, one of them is white lusterless glass. In the 1880s, Frederick Shirley was producing ornamental pieces in pure white glass, which after being dulled by hydrofluoric acid gave it the appearance of alabaster. And this was the first art glass to be produced at Mount Washington. And most of these pieces were also decorated and they were decorated in a three-story building on the premises, which was entirely devoted to decoration. And the um, gentleman who designed this white lusterless glass, the decoration for it was Albert Steffen. He was a superintendent at Mount Washington. And usually these items that were decorated, whether they be lamps, vases, or in our case, a perfume bottle, were decorated with pink, blue, or purple flowers. And so the, these photos really don't do the cut glass justice. Um, it's really beautiful to see in person. Uh, in the 1870s, Mount Washington made a lot of cut glass. The early patterns were relatively simple, but in the 1880s and 1890s, the cut glass became more ornate and that period was known as brilliant cut glass. Um, glass cutters were among the best paid uh, of glass decorators and cut glass was the most expensive kind of glass that Mount Washington and later Pearpoint produced. 
And it was often said that if a cutter or engraver was trained at Mount Washington or Pierpoint, they could work anywhere. And since true cut glass is entirely hand decorated, high labor costs made it extremely expensive and out of reach to all but the wealthy. And of course, intense competition, both domestic and from abroad in the introduction of inexpensive pressed glass um, forced cost cutting shortcuts. In addition to that, you know, the vogue of setting entire tables with glass was passing and the industry began its decline. Um, another factor was the outbreak of World War I. Lead oxide, which is an essential ingredient in glass made for cutting, was needed for more urgent uses. And by the time the war ended, the few factories that had managed to survive used their resources to produce less costly glass. And so I also have an example of a modern glass cutter. Um, cut glass is glass that has been decorated entirely by hand by use of rotating wheels. Cuts are made on an otherwise completely smooth surface of the glass by artisans holding and moving the piece against various sized metal or stone wheels to produce a pattern. And cutting may be combined with other decorative techniques, but cut glass usually refers to a glass object that has been decorated entirely by cutting. And really the technique of glass cutting changed very little between the first century AD and the end of the 19th century. It has always used a small rotating wheel, uh, usually coated with some abrasive substance and usually with a liquid lubricant like water. Another highlight from our case is Burmese glass. It was accidentally created in New Bedford at Mount Washington in 1881. Burmese is a type of opaque colored glass with shading from yellow to pink. It's either made with a common satin finish or an uncommon shiny finish, which is highlighted in the case. And uh, as I said, it was created accidentally by Frederick Shirley in 1881, who was the manager of Mount Washington. Shirley was not a glass blower, but he felt that the company needed new products and would experiment with formulas. And it was in that year that he began experimenting with a pot of ruby glass. And so the coloring for ruby glass uses gold and is pretty expensive. And when he was experimenting, he found that the gold in the batch quickly sank to the bottom of the pot. And so what he did is he filled it with uranium oxide. My brother told me it's a tax. Oh, I'm sorry, could you mute? Sorry, whoever just joined. Um, so uranium oxide is used to make canary yellow glass. Uh, when Shirley reheated the glass and began working with it, he discovered that it turned coral around the edges and thus Burmese glass was created. And the glass that we see in the case here was made by my father, uh, Fred Abbott. There is a decorative flask and a mini decorative vase that we have in the case, which was made for me when I was born. And it was decorated by an artist named Larray Parrish. And what's interesting about decorated glass is that the artist is essentially decorating it blind. Um, none of the bright colors can be seen until the work is complete and the, the piece is fired in the kiln, fusing the metal to the glass. And so another highlight from the case is peach blow, which was also uh, discovered by Frederick Shirley. It's another type of opaque colored glass with shading from cream to pink. Um, and it wasn't very popular in the 19th century and therefore not much of it was made. And so any peach blow from the 19th century is pretty rare. And here we have some peach blow that was made by my father. Uh, we have uh, both shiny and a satin finish. We have a decorative vase as well as a decorative pear and a Paul Revere bowl, which was decorated by artist Larray Parrish. And probably my favorite highlight from the case are paperweights. Um, I remember my father making them when I would uh, hang out with him at work in the 90s. And I just think they're some of the most beautiful pieces of contemporary uh, glasswork. And paperweights first appeared in Europe around the mid 1840s. And while they were viewed as luxury items, they were really inexpensive to make. And throughout the 19th century, most paperweights were appreciated for their decorative aspects. Yet again, by the glass houses, they were the least valued object and they were not considered as artistically important as they are today. And then when we go through into the 20th century, many glass artists have challenged themselves to break away from traditional paperweight design and to use techniques in new ways. And in 1962, the studio glass movement emerged in the US. And so you're moving away from 
creating glass in factories to working in a studio where people can come and actually watch you create um, glass, which is what my dad did. And these artists, rather than creating something for functional means, they created for artistic ends. And so this case is really just a mini little exhibit that's going to be hopefully something much bigger at the end of the year. I'm currently have an exhibit in the works titled Made in New Bedford, and it's not going to just include glass, but really all of the industries that New Bedford house. Um, but another thing that we have coming up, uh, a much more detailed, a much longer presentation, maybe a much more interesting presentation is on May 12th, the Maker Series, Glass Blowing with Alfred Abbott. It'll be a joint presentation with myself and my father. Um, it is free as part of AHA Night, and it will be in person as of now. Um, and I will be talking about the history of glass blowing, whereas my dad, with some footage we have from the 90s, will really be explaining the techniques in glass blowing and how you would create, you know, a, a work of art, really. And so I hope you enjoyed this small presentation. I am sorry that we weren't able to see it in person. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know.